Welcome to Heart to Heart with Michael, featuring your host, Michael Lieben. Our program is designed to empower the bereaved community with information and stories from those who have suffered the most terrible loss. Michael Lieben, himself a bereaved father, will be meeting with people from around the world to share and to draw hope from their experiences. And now, here is Michael Lieben. Welcome, friends, to the first episode of the first season of Heart to Heart with Michael, a program for the bereaved community. Our purpose is to empower our community. Today's show is The Last Days, and here with us to discuss this topic is our guest, Nancy Jensen. Nancy and her husband, Carl, have three heart-healthy sons and Jessica. Jessica was born with Tetralogy of Fallot, pulmonary atresia, severe pulmonary artery stenosis, non-confluent pulmonary branches, major aortopulmonary collateral arteries, and DeGeorge syndrome. Jessica was blue her whole life because despite five heart surgeries, she never had a complete repair. Jessica became oxygen dependent and needed a motorized wheelchair as walking became more difficult for her. Jessica had two strokes, which greatly affected her development. But miraculously, she mostly recovered from them, surprising just about everyone. Jessica never progressed beyond the level of a seven or eight-year-old child and remained a sweet little girl, even though she suffered from separation anxiety and bouts of depression. Sadly, Jessica passed away on October 4th, 2010. She survived 22 years despite all her medical issues. Nancy continues to support the CHD community, offering compassion to CHD warriors, their families, and bereaved parents including yours truly, and I hope we get to that later on. So thank you, Nancy, for coming on to Heart to Heart with Michael. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Let's get right into it. We have a lot to discuss. Tell me a little bit about life with Jessica on a typical day. Well, in the very beginning, she was very, very sick, and we practically lived at the hospital. And as she grew a little older, she became oxygen dependent and needed a motorized wheelchair in order to be able to get around because she couldn't walk and breathe at the same time. And as her health deteriorated, she um, ended up spending a good part of her time in her hospital bed and doing things in her room. Um, She also had ischemia of the bowels that I think we forgot to put in there. And that caused her a lot of pain. And um, she also had lung bleeds uh, for a while. So she had a lot of anxiety And um, the last quite a few years of her life, um, she stayed up really late at night due to anxiety and fear. And so I would stay up most of the night with her. We would watch her TV shows. We would color. We'd bead necklaces. um, And we spent a lot of quality time. And, you know, there were nights when she was crying and, and really had a difficult time getting to sleep. But other nights, it it was nice. Um, My husband would get up early in the morning. He was working days. So he could get uh, the boys and uh, get them up and get them ready for school and take them to school. And I would sleep in and I would get up late morning and um, help Jessica get prepared for the day. She, um, as I said, had a lot of abdominal pain so um, it took her good part of the day for that pain to subside enough for her to eat very much and uh, her eating times were like late at night and so that's when I would stay up and uh, make sure she got food and and whatnot. You obviously had to spend a lot of time with her more than an average parent would spend with a child. How did your other sons feel about all the time that you had to spend with her and not with them? Well, they kind of grew up with it um, because, you know, one son is older and the other two came along and she was already, she always needed um, a lot of attention. She had strokes, so she needed therapy and she always needed help, you know, preparing her food, help having a bath. Um, She was in pull-ups at night and they kind of grew up with it. Um, Every once in a while, they would get jealous, but I tried to spend quality time with each of my sons, or as a group, or as they needed it. One son in particular had a more difficult time, and so I would take time to explain to him why she needed that attention. 
And he now has told me that he has thanked me for teaching him mm-hmm. that just because someone needs more attention doesn't mean that they are loved more than other children. That's really true. And sometimes actually it's the other way around. It's, you know, you can, if you love someone or trust them or you can let them be on their own more and you know they're going to be all right. But what what is it like to, you know, spend quality time with them? So did you feel guilty for not being with her at the time that you were with them? Was that, were you torn apart like that? Yes, always. I was always torn apart when, I mean, I would miss my son's drama performances Mm -hmm. or um, feel bad because there were other things that I had wanted to do with them when they were younger, like go on field trips but I wasn't able to. So I have still have some feelings of guilt about that. But I know in my heart that I did what I needed to do in order to care for all four of my children. As your kids now are more grown up, do, they, do you sense that they've become better adults because of this? Yes. Every single one of them have said that and have ex- to me different ways that Mm -hmm. how they have grown uh, because of their sister and like they would say well without Jessica I wouldn't have the compassion for others that I have now or our family wouldn't be as strong as it is now so it's really nice to see them maturing and and growing and learning what or realizing what they have learned Carl has a very difficult job. He's a police officer. I know he's working shifts. I know it's not an easy job to carry. How did you manage between the two of you to share that load, raising everybody, keeping everything together? And you yourself, we haven't talked about this, but you have your own medical issues. Who says we kept everything together? (laughs) Good good answer. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. And Carl had to go to um, court and, you know, his, he has a very demanding job and sometimes it got very scary. But um, thankfully, through our state, we have help of home health aides, and they could come into our home, and I could take a nap while they were here. And I did that a lot, especially the last, oh, six, seven, eight, ten years of Jessica's life when my health started to get worse. So that was really, really a lifesaver for me to be able to have them come in and they would visit with Jessica, they would fix her her food, they would bathe her, so they would take some of the load off of me. And towards the end, when my husband was working day shift, um, Mm -hmm. but he's also on a squad where he can call in and say, hey, my wife needs to take our daughter to the doctors, she needs my help, so I'm going to come in an hour late. And he could oh, do that. Nice. That was very nice because towards the end, I couldn't lift the oxygen anymore. It was mm. very hard for me to tie the wheelchair, that 600-pound wheelchair, onto the lift, which is on the back of the vehicle, and, you know, all that stuff. And so he was there to help do all that stuff and also to ask questions with the doctors where, in the beginning, it was all me. Because he was in school and working several jobs. Yeah. So yeah. it was so nice to have him there to, to help me with that. Did you find that you were Jessica's mom and he was the boy's father and that there was a division that way? That's kind of how we shared things with the boys, like scouting. My husband was a boy scout, or is a boy scout, and he would take them scouting and to their activities, to... Um, to camp and for a while there he was taking the boys to church because I would be up all night with Jessica and we did not have a home health aid on Sunday so I wasn't able to go Jessica was too sick to go so he'd take the boys to church and I mean it was very helpful for us to be able to do it that way I think it's always very nice when it works out this is the sort of thing that you know can either bind you so much more together or can um, really just atomize the family and and you're very lucky that's not what happened thank you so much Nancy for sharing your story with our listeners and for sharing Jessica with us now it's time for commercial break but don't go far because when we get back we're going to talk about how your family prepared to say goodbye to Jessica and Jessica's own awareness of her oncoming death 
Hi, I'm John Montez of NBC's hit a cappella show, The Sing Off. In a cappella music, it takes a team to create a sound that many will enjoy, just like it'll take a team to help my good friend Miles Schweitzer, an HLHS survivor. Let's help Miles fulfill his dream and make a big enough sound to bring awareness to congenital heart disease. Please visit him at GoFundMe.com backwards slash The Miles Project. Miles with the Y. Again, that's GoFundMe.com The Miles Project. This is for Miles. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Michael. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our program, please send an email to Michael Lieben at Michael at Heart to Heart with Michael.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Michael. Welcome back to our program, Heart to Heart with Michael. Today we're talking with bereaved mother Nancy Jensen. Nancy, at a certain point it became clear to you and your husband that Jessica was not doing well. So how did you come to accept that she would need hospice care? And, and what was the process of coming around to saying, we need this, we're going to have to do this, this is, this is the end? Well, Michael, we actually had to do that twice. In 2004, Jessica was having lung bleeds. And they finally did a cath and endoscopy and found that she had collaterals going, the collaterals she had going from her aorta to the lungs were bursting and bleeding into the lungs. And they coiled off two major ones, but that was her primary way of getting blood to her lungs due to her messed up pulmonary arteries. We knew it was the end and it was just like a kick in the gut. And the lung bleeds were horrible because she would be coughing and choking on the blood, crying out, I'm not ready to die. My younger sons would go and hide in their bedroom or at the family room where they couldn't hear her and cry. So I would have to go and take care of them after I got her calmed down when the lung bleed would stop. So we got hospice in and it just was all like a whirlwind and fortunately the hospice nurse came with me to a pulmonary appointment and she had recommended doing morphine therapy that they had found that giving morphine either orally or through a breathing treatment would help the pulmonary arteries relax well with Jessica it actually stopped the lung bleeds and they kicked us out of hospice after a year (laughs) Because she hadn't had a lung bleed in six months. So we were very, very fortunate when that stopped. But we knew that she had still her CHD issues. And then we finally found an answer to the abdominal pain, which was caused by ischemic bowels. And that was also terminal. So she had two terminal illnesses, and her pain kept getting worse and worse. We took her to doctor after doctor. Nobody wanted to increase her morphine. Nobody had answers on how to control her pain. I even called the previous hospice team in, and they refused to take her. And that was uh, the spring of 2010. And she, um, and I kept trying to tell the doctors she's retaining more fluid, but they didn't see it because it wasn't in her feet and ankles. But I told them she spends most of her day in bed with her feet up. Mm. But anyway, finally, after her 22nd birthday in June, her feet swelled up to what we called balloon feet. She was hospitalized, and a palliative care doctor came in. And she's the first one that finally said, she needs more pain medication. She needs more pain control. She was the one that recommended a hospice, which was also palliative care. Well, at that point, was Jessica aware of her declining health? Did she understand what hospice meant? She did not understand what hospice meant. When when they came into the home, it was a, a different hospice. The doctor came to our house and finally... I knew I didn't have to drag her out to really stupid doctor's appointments Mm -hmm. when they just wanted to see her, you know. Um, The nurse was so compassionate. And towards the very end, like a few weeks before she died, she realized what was happening. So we explained. How do you know that? Because she said, Mommy, I don't want to die. But I know I'm going to have to go. Oh boy. Things like that. She would say, 
and you know we're Christians, and we had a picture of Jesus up on her wall, along with other pictures that were important to her and family members that uh, Carl had printed up, or ancestors, people that she was going to be meeting. And so she would feel more safe, and she would say, pointing at Jesus, I'm kind of mad at him. I said, that's okay. And we would talk, and she didn't want to talk about it. And we would say, Jessica, when you see of the light, you need to go to the light. And your cousin Marcus will be there. Because her cousin had passed away two years prior to that. And I believe he helped her. Wow. I believe he helped her. That's amazing. Let's turn again a little bit in a different direction. How did you explain all of this to the to the boys, that this is what was happening and what hospice meant? And did they understand that the end was coming close? We would talk about it privately away from Jessica. Mm -hmm. And um, I have always had a really, really good relationship with each one of my boys. They come to me when they have something that they need to talk about. And they've told me, thank you for listening. So I've kept that line of communication open and so that they could talk to me. And then the second time, it was the hospice nurse. And it was more obvious that it's going to be time soon because Jessica went 64 days without being able to eat. Oh so my gosh. we knew that it was definitely coming. And she was too weak to get out of bed or even at the end to hold her head up. So it was very obvious, and we would go out to the family room and discuss it and cry and allow the boys to talk about their feelings if they wanted to. Um, and at the very end, they didn't spend a whole lot of time in her room with her. She mm -hmm. was sleeping most of the time, and it was just so hard for them to see her deteriorate. So they did not spend a lot of time in there and I didn't make them did they try not to cry in front of her was there some rule about that we did not have a rule about that um, they could show their emotion if they wanted to mm -hmm. um, I think that for her benefit they did not show emotion hmm. when they were talking to her how okay. old were they when this was happening Oh, gosh, now I have to do math. <laughs> <laughs> Austin was just starting high school. He was a freshman. Okay. Brandon was two years older. And then my oldest son was married and out of the house. And him so and his you're wife. you teenage, were teenagers and an adult. Yes. There was at one point when we the nurse took us out there and she said, I think it's time. If there's anything you want to tell your sister, well, we should probably do it today. And I'm going to have to hold you right here. And I want to thank you again for being on the program and opening up to us about how your family was coping with losing Jessica in those final moments. And I know that many families here will really be able to relate to this story and gain strength from it because many of us have been in situations very similar to that. In our final segment, I'd like to talk to you about how you keep Jessica and her memory alive because I know that's very, very important to you. So we'll be back right after this. When I saw so many of these CHG groups growing, I found family just ready to join me. Anyone who is a member of the adult congenital heart defect community can be a guest on our show. We have a great year planned and we look forward to sharing other interesting topics. Heart to Heart with Nicole and David serving the ACHD community Wednesdays at noon Eastern. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Michael. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on Michael's program, please email him at michael at hearttoheartwithmichael.com. Now, back to our program. Welcome back to our program, Heart to Heart with Michael. Today, we're talking with bereaved mother, Nancy Jensen. Nancy, this is an interesting question to me in particular, because this is something that we've all had to deal with. What about your ongoing relationship with Jessica? Because I know she's very much still with you all the time. I think that um, 
with my faith and having grown up with this faith of um, knowing that we exist beyond um, death and that I have felt, I don't know, kind of a connection to my grandmother who passed away and I was very close to her on occasion. I feel her with me. I feel Jessica with me like almost all the time. Now for Jessica, I took care of her 24 hours a day for over 22 years and she needed me. If I left the house, she would call me every five minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, Mommy, I need you, you know. And as we mentioned before, I spent a lot, a lot of time with her, not just taking care of her medical needs, but her emotional needs. And so that was one thing that was really hard for me in the beginning is to not be able to physically take care of her. So I found ways, other ways to fill that need of taking care of her Mm -hmm. in my artwork. Everything I do, if you know my relationship with Jessica, you'll see Jessica in it. Her favorite colors, maybe, Mm -hmm. um, you know, different things. And that's a way that I continue that relationship. I, um, we talk about her a lot every day. Um, Either her dad or I will joke about her little Jessica-isms. She loved to joke about every little thing Um, and we do that and we remind each other of those things or we will quote her so she is very much a part of our lives and I think that in a way when I am can say that I feel her with me Mm -hmm. um, I kind of think that's partially the grieving process maybe when I'm missing her more I can feel her with me more if that makes sense it absolutely does Um, make sense you know um, I think that a lot of bereaved families don't understand or don't recognize that as being their child being with them but I also have thought you know Jessica needed me just as much as I needed her So she might be with me because she still needs to be with me, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense, and it leads me directly to my next question. You're a member of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, which most of us know as the Mormon Church. Um, And I'm sure that's a very important part of your ongoing relationship, and I'd like to hear more about that because that's very interesting. A lot of people don't know much about it. Okay, well... In a nutshell, our belief is that we existed as spirits, literal children of a loving father who created this world for us to come and experience, as we could grow and progress, lives with mortal bodies. This is the first time that we could get married and have children and experience new things. And that this was never supposed to be a forever home. Our, our mortal bodies. Mm-hmm. They, we came to learn how to have faith, how to believe in our Father without being with Him. We learned how to make decisions on our own and um, have trials. And through our trials, we learn and we grow. And so, death is a part of the plan so that we can go after that to a spirit world where we can continue to learn and grow and be together and teach each other things. Then in the um, there will be Christ coming again, and we will all be resurrected into eternal bodies that will never die, that will not be sick, and will continue to learn and grow in that sphere, and will continue, you know, as families, and, and continue those relationships and friendships that we've made that's i I find that totally fascinating and what in a a sense it actually eases the pain of the end of life as you look towards the continuing portion to come and i think that's really 
I can see where that would be very, very comforting. The rest of your family, the boys, there are things in their daily lives that help them remember and, and as it were, to continue to live with Jessica? Well, in their own way, I guess. They joke around also when we talk about Jessica-isms. Mm-hmm. Um, they participate in our silly socks when we um, have silly socks on Jessica's anniversary and on her birthday. And um, we were going to try to make it a custom to go to the grave. Um, and we've done that, but not every year because of, you know, my husband's schedule or, you know, just um, different things. So sometimes, most of the time we have, though, gone to the graveside and placed flowers or cleaned it up a little bit and and watched for these little birds that are called vermilion flycatchers that are there. They're beautiful. And butterflies, of course. Of course, butterflies. Let's hear more about the butterflies. I know that's a thing. <laughs> that is a huge thing. So when Jessica, just out of the blue, probably about a week before she passed away, she kind of woke up and she said, Mommy, I'm going to send you butterflies from heaven. And I just was taken aback. And I said, thank you, Jessica. I'll look for every single one of them. And just a few months after she passed away, one of my sons told me, Mom, I know that butterfly thing is between you and Jessica, but I have never seen more butterflies in my life. And I said, of course it's not just between me and Jessica. (laughs) It's for all of us. And she sends us many butterflies. Well, what's that like? Are you you just like walking around and suddenly there's butterflies or how does that happen? Oh, my gosh. Yes, that happens. I've had them fly right around me, around in circles, around me. When I'm driving, they fly right in front of my windshield, right in front of my car. (laughs) I mean, it is super obvious. And one time my husband said, hey, did you see that butterfly? I say, no, I didn't. And another one will come. I go, okay, Jessica, I got the message. (laughs) So we'll say, hi, Jessica. Oh, you're coming to church with us. Or, oh, you're coming wherever with us, you know. (laughs) So you really feel her presence. You really feel her presence all the time with you. Almost. Every once in a while, I feel like, well, she's off helping somebody else. And that's okay. Notably, I know that she was helping Liel. Uh, We've discussed this, that that she was there to greet Liel. And and I absolutely believe that's true. Um, I, I do, too. I absolutely believe that's true, and I and I think that Jessica has been a part of everybody that she's touched and remains a part of everybody that she's touched. The butterflies are something between you and her personally, but from what everything I know and everything I've heard, she is as kind as her mother and clearly her mother's child, and oh, you, you guys have created a wonderful, wonderful family, and it's been... A pleasure knowing you, and I, we have just about a minute, and I, I, I did want to get to this. When we were uh, at the end with Liel, um, we were, you know, maybe 10,000 miles away from you. We were on the phone with you all the time, gaining from your experience and your calmness and your ability to make everything seem like it was all in place the way it should be. And <clears throat> our final days with Liel, and we had no warning, we had three days our final days were made so much better and so much kinder because we had you and your experience with us. Oh, and thank I, I, you. This is a chance for me to thank you in front of everybody. So thank oh. you so much. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> it's what and I guess do. <laughs> what? Guess what? That concludes this episode of Heart to Heart with Michael. I'll talk with you soon. And until then, remember, it's okay to breathe. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you have gained strength from listening to our program. Heart to Heart with Michael can be heard every Thursday at noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next time when we'll share more stories. If you would like to continue today's discussion, please join us right after the program in the Hug Podcast chat room on Pal Talk.